Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in about five minutes. Vascular imaging number one. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move on to the next case. Ready? Let's go. All right, case one, carotid ultrasound. All right, so on the left-hand side, we have these two grayscale images of the left proximal common carotid artery. On the superior sagittal image, you can see that there's this linear echogenicity extending through the lumen of the common carotid artery. On this lower transverse image, you can see that there's a double lumen appearance here with this intimal flap extending across the lumen. And on the color Doppler imaging on the right-hand side, on the superior sagittal image, you can see that there's color flow in both of these lumina but they're different colors. And on the lowermost transverse image, you again get that double lumen sign. And this is typical for a common carotid artery dissection. This patient actually had a aortic arch dissection that was extending up into the bilateral common carotid arteries. So dissections are most common in elderly hypertensive patients, and it occurs when there's a tear in the intima and blood enters the medial layer of the vessel wall, forming a blood-filled false lumen within the wall. And typically the false lumen is larger in size than the true lumen. So on ultrasound, you might not always see this intimal flap on the grayscale images, but this double lumen appearance is fairly characteristic on color Doppler. All right, case two, slide one of two, 20-year-old female CT angiogram. Slide two of two, coronal and sagittal reformatted images. Okay, so on these images of the lower thoracic aorta, you can see there's very marked thickening of the aortic wall. It's homogeneously hyperdense, and as we move into the abdominal aorta, the thickening is even more pronounced, and we also have associated aortic luminal narrowing there. And the thickening continues along the superior mesenteric artery, causing some luminal narrowing. Also notice how at the origins of the renal arteries, there's also some surrounding thickening there. And in a female patient of this age, this is typical for Takayasu arteritis. So this is a chronic large vessel vasculitis, typically affecting the aorta and its major branches, and it's much more common in females, and also has a higher prevalence in Asian populations. The onset is usually between ages 15 and 30, and the symptoms are variable depending on where the stenotic lesions or thrombus formation is occurring. Takayasu arteritis may only involve the aortic arch and its branches, but in this case, it's involving the descending thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta, and some of the mesenteric and renal arteries. So with Takayasu arteritis, you might also see wall thickening, enhancement, stenosis, and occlusion. You can also see aneurysm and pseudoaneurysm formation as the disease progresses. These images show, again, the wall thickening involving the descending thoracic aorta continuing into the abdominal aorta and surrounding that supramesenteric artery. Look at that stenosis of the right renal artery, but we don't have any iliac artery involvement. So treatment is typically with corticosteroids. This patient had a follow-up MRI following treatment with prednisone, and you can see the disease has almost completely resolved. We see just a little bit of residual wall thickening about that aorta. Occasionally, though, patients may also need angioplasty or stent placement for arterial stenosis and occlusion. All right, next case, slide one of two, post-catheterization groin mass ultrasound. Slide two of two. Now, how could you treat this? So in this patient post-catheterization, we are looking at grayscale and color Doppler imaging of the superficial soft tissues of the groin. And the grayscale images show this heterogeneous kind of complex collection, which on color Doppler imaging, we can see is a pseudoaneurysm of the common femoral artery. So here's the common femoral artery posteriorly, and there's a neck extending from the common femoral artery into this pseudoaneurysm sac. And it has that characteristic yin-yang or swirling appearance of vascular flow within the sac. You might initially think, hey, this looks like another double lumen for a carotid dissection. But the difference is the carotid arteries are not located in the groin, just to review. <laughs> and then also, we don't see a grayscale intimal flap here. And this is a completely saccular structure. It's not a tubular structure, as you'd expect to see with a dissection. Now, these color Doppler images sequentially show the to and fro pattern of flow typically seen in the neck of the pseudoaneurysm. Specifically, there's flow into the pseudoaneurysm during systole and then flow back out of the pseudoaneurysm on diastole through the neck. And you see this kind of fluctuating pattern of flow within the neck on all these images. And then notice, too, the fluctuating flow within the aneurysm sac, again, having that yin-yang appearance on multiple images. So how could you treat this? Well, in this case, it was treated with ultrasound-guided compression of the pseudoaneurysm. This is after compression. You can see that we now no longer have any blood flow within that pseudoaneurysm sac. Another option is using ultrasound-guided thrombin injection, which tends to be faster and has generally been shown to be more successful 
It can also be done in patients who are anticoagulated. Just one contraindication to be aware of for thrombin injection is the presence of an AV fistula. And here's just some spectral Doppler imaging showing that there is definitely no flow in that pseudoaneurysm sac after compression, which is an expected result. We do still have some persistent flow within the neck of the pseudoaneurysm, but in most patients this typically occludes spontaneously over hours to days, which is what occurred in this patient. Also, you can see the arterial waveform in the neck is unusually high resistance, and that's likely due to the fact that the pseudoaneurysm sac is now occluded. And we do still get a bit of sense of that to and fro pattern in the neck where you have flow above the baseline as it's going towards the pseudoaneurysm during systole. And then we do get some reversal of diastolic flow as it moves away from the pseudoaneurysm sac during diastole. All right, case four, chest pain, slide one of three, CT angiogram. Slide two of three, coronal and sagittal reformations of the aorta. Slide three of three, this was a comparison CT scan five months earlier, coronal image of the lower thoracic upper abdominal aorta. Okay, so we're looking at a series of contrast enhanced axial images of the lower thoracic upper abdominal aorta showing the saculation of contrast here, which extends beyond the normal lumen of the aorta, but you can see that it is communicating with the lumen. And there's also a small rind of soft tissue density about it. And this is typical for an acute penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. So anytime you have a patient presenting with acute aortic syndrome, of course you want to exclude aortic dissection or a rapidly expanding aortic aneurysm, but don't forget about penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer and also intramural hematoma. And this is often confused with just ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque, which is confined to the intima, and that's usually pretty benign. But an ulcer will penetrate into the internal elastic lamina of the intima into the media and extends beyond the normal aortic wall margin. And sometimes coronal and sagittal images can help with that distinction. Here you can see that this penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer is clearly extending beyond the normal aortic lumen. And also you can better see that there's this soft tissue rind adjacent to it corresponding to an intramural hematoma, which is often associated with penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Now treatment for these ulcers is typically with endovascular therapy. And indications for treatment would include symptomatic patients, or if you have an asymptomatic patient with an ulcer involved in the ascending thoracic aorta, because those are a bit more risky. And then also if you have a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer associated with an intramural hematoma, like in this case. And if these are untreated, complications include pseudoaneurysm, aortic rupture, and aortic dissection. Now, the penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer, pseudoaneurysm, and contained rupture is kind of a spectrum and can be difficult to differentiate, and is often treated the same, but a pseudoaneurysm tends to have a narrow neck. Now, other differential diagnostic considerations for a patient like this, if there's a history of trauma, you'd think of traumatic aortic injury. And if there's a history of infection, you might think of a mycotic pseudoaneurysm, but this patient had uh, neither of those histories. Now, anytime you have comparison studies, that's key to look at because comparison imaging is your friend. <laughs> and you can see that this pseudoaneurysm was just starting to form five months ago, ulcerating a bit beyond the lumen. And that's helpful in determining the need for therapy, if it's expanding or not, which in this case, it clearly had expanded significantly from this prior study. All right, last case, we're looking at the main portal vein. All right, so when you're looking at the main portal vein, you want to look at a few things. So you want to make sure it's flowing in the correct direction, which is towards the liver, and that's hepatopetal flow. And so normally the portal vein should be red or matching the uppermost bar on the color Doppler scale there. So that's normal. And then if you're measuring velocity, you want to make sure the angle of incidence is correct, and that should be below 60 degrees. Here it's 54 degrees, so that's good. And then the velocity here is 32 centimeters per second. Normally it's 16 to 40 centimeters per second, so that's normal. And if it's below 16 centimeters per second, that's typical for portal hypertension. And then you want to look at the waveform. So normally the waveform should be above baseline, which is this line here. And then it should just gently undulate or have mild pulsatility. In this case, though, it's very pulsatile, meaning it's very peaky. And then it also extends below the baseline here. And during parts of diastole. So you could call this waveform as predominantly antegrade, meaning predominantly above the baseline, but also pulsatile and then bidirectional biphasic. So this is an example of pulsatile portal venous flow. You can also calculate this by evaluating the portal vein pulsatility index, and that's if you take the trough portal velocity, which is this velocity down here, the end diastolic velocity, and divide that by the peak portal velocity, which corresponds to systole. It's normally greater than 0.5, in this case, it was less than 0.5. So what can cause that? So causes include right heart failure, which was the cause in this case, and also tricuspid regurgitation. Severe cirrhosis with arterial portal shunting can also cause pulsatile portal venous flow. And you can differentiate these because tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure tend to have dilated hepatic veins, whereas cirrhosis tends to compress the hepatic veins because the liver gets all fibrotic. 
You can also occasionally see this in the setting of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, where you get AV fistulas, but in that case you'll see a very dilated hepatic artery and you also see multiple tortuous intrahepatic AV fistulas. And then of course you have to be careful because increased portal vein pulsatility can also occur in young healthy patients, so it's not always an indicator of pathology. Hey, that's it for five cases in exactly five minutes. Vascular imaging number one. Well, maybe not exactly. <laughs> if you enjoyed this lecture, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be magnificent if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info and to follow us on social media to get updates. Thanks and have a great day.